I'm Donald Moffat. And I'm Heather Menzies. Logan's run will not be on tonight. But stay tuned for the Charlie Brown special and the Fat Albert Halloween special. And we'll be back next Monday night. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. This portrait of Jean Grey, the Phoenix, is one of the ones I did for a series of single frame uh, mock-up kind of covers for the Marvelocity book where my concept was it would work like an accordion when you open up the book getting past the initial Captain America cover you would fold it out and you get Iron Man and character after character after character and it allowed me then to do multiple Marvel character portraits uh, Phoenix being one of the most primary Marvel concepts because her storyline back in 1980, the invention of that character, that maturation of Jean Grey into the Phoenix was one of the best storylines in the history of comics and stands out as one of the most important female superheroes. Coming February 21st, it's Faye and the Moon, the latest graphic novel from Franco and the Saturn Sisters. Faye, mourning for her missing mother, sits night after night below the moon that her mother loved dearly. One night she discovers she can pluck the moon out of the star-filled sky. Back safe in her house, she holds it close, feeling comfort at last. Then Faye loses the moon and finds that taking it has awakened ancient monsters, rats, dragons, and more, who hunt for it for themselves. Will Faye be able to reclaim the moon, find her own inner strength, and save the world from eternal darkness? Faye and the Moon comes from the minds of Franco, whose works include Tiny Titans, Superman of Smallville, Archimaniacs, Itty Bitty Hellboy, and The Ghost and the Owl, and art from the Saturn Sisters, whose animated works include Sesame Studios' The New Neighbors, Hulu's The Awesomes by Seth Meyers, and PBS's Mira, Selkie from the Sea. Pre-order Faye and the Moon now. Available in bookstores and comic shops everywhere, February 21st. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Philip Kennedy Johnson also here. Always great to welcome Philip back to Word Balloon. How you doing, man? I'm great, man. Welcome, welcome to my home. <laughs> this is a uh, undescript, um, undisclosed location, which is clearly a hotel room in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I always appreciate it, Philip. That's uh, I always appreciate your time. I know the fans do as well. We already have well wishes for uh, people. Uh, you know, Pumpkin Time. Thanks a lot for the advance. Oh, cool. And he says he loves your work uh, on Extreme Carnage. And of course, oh, his War World Saga was his brother's first Superman comic. Wow. Whoa. Oh, that, what a huge honor to hear. That's awesome. And thanks for supporting the book. Absolutely, man. Um, geez, should we start right away with the news uh, that uh, broke yesterday? Your uh, work at Marvel continues and now uh, taking over Incredible Hulk? Yeah, man. It's a huge honor. And it's the fact that they, they, um, they're putting the traditional name on it, too is a huge honor and not lost on me. I really appreciate that. It's just putting the name Incredible Hulk on the book. It's just like the statement, like, you know, the book is back. We have this big plan that's going to go a long way. And we're just, we're all really, really excited about it. Yeah, man. And forgive me. I, I know the art. Is it Nick Patera that's doing the draw? No, who's doing the art for the you? Art. Oh, no, it's Nick Klein. Nick Klein. Excuse me, Nick. Very sorry. Uh, very excited that I'm, I'm bringing up the image as we're talking right now. Uh, the cover is that a Nick cover? Yes. Good. Yeah, Nick's cover. He says hi. Actually, he's uh, he he knows the show. Yeah, I haven't had I haven't had uh, Nick on yet, uh, but no, I, he's I, a he's a German artist. He lives in Germany, but his uh, his English is sensational. <laughs> you you, oh, I mean, wow. you can almost I, not even hear an accent at all. He's amazing. Phil, I love having um, uh, European and South American and Australian and everyone outside of the United States on the show. And it really does thrill me, literally, 
when I have someone who English is their second language, but they're they're amazing at it. And, yeah, it it shames know. me honestly. I, 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 I it is ninety nine percent of Americans, man. Yeah, dude, I I've learned I've learned like a little bit of a whole bunch of languages, and they I just cannot retain it for for shit, you know. Absolutely. Here's uh, here's that great cover uh, art, and um, yeah, Gosh. this is I, I, this is really a great opportunity, and it's um, as I read it described, uh, this is more of a monster book than uh, what we, maybe we've seen lately. So. Yes. Can you tell us what you can uh, with that information? Sure, man. I The first arc is going to be called Age of Monsters, in fact. And um, we considered calling the book just Hulk, Age of Monsters, but I didn't want it to feel like a, just like a little event book that was just kind of, kind of come and go. Um, <clears throat> so they gave it the, the old school Incredible Hulk title as it should, as it should have, in my opinion. Absolutely. And um, Age of Monsters, though, is kind of, kind of sums up what the thing is. For one thing, I've got to say, I, I know people are going to wonder, are going to ask, like, who my biggest influence is for the series and everything. And it's got to be Immortal. Immortal Hulk was just so great. Um, sometimes there's a run, even if it's not the first run, or uh, sometimes it just is such a such a perfect fit for a thing that it just kind of sucks all the air out of a room, and it makes it impossible not to not to continue at least somewhat in that vein. And Immortal was just such a perfect fit. Um, so that's the one I'm going with most, I think I do, I do know some, some of the older stuff and I know a lot of those stories are really iconic. I mean, Donnie did a great job very recently with Ryan. Sure did. Uh, there was the, the Hulk gray thing back in the day that I think was amazing. Peter David's uh, Hulk gray or the, um, or Jeff Jeff Lowe, Tim Sale, Tim I believe. Sale, sure. Excuse yeah, me, I was thinking, was, Mr. I was thinking yeah, of Mr. Dixon and everything, but no, 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 Hulk gray. I, that was one of their best. Absolutely. Yeah. David had an iconic run. Um, there's, there's other stuff that I like a lot. I re I read, uh, Jim Ruggs grand design recently, which was really cool. It's just kind of, like I got to get it. this whole thing, you know, it's yeah. so, so great. And no, I love, I love, I, I love Jim and I, and I love when, uh, Pisker did it with X-Men and right. I love that Jim did it with, uh, with the Hulk and everything. And, uh, yeah. no, I, he's due back. I, I love talking to Jim. Yeah. Right. Jim's, Jim's love for the Hulk just, just bleeds off every page you know it's just so so lovingly done um, um and i i think planet hulk might might have been my favorite my favorite run up until, Greg Pock, until yeah. yeah so so well done but uh immortal to me is just, i mean planet hulk is not something is not something you can do you know into the into the distance it's like a that's an event you know like planet hulk is this beautiful um you know, event that that begins is its own thing, a very specific style and ends. But Immortal Hulk to me it was like the approach. Like that's how that's how you do Hulk. I mean, and even Stan Lee has talked about his the you know the origins of Hulk being just the idea of a Frankenstein slash Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. And I just wanted to lean into that. And if anything, it was kind of hard to decide like how do I how do I not just ape what Al and Joe did on Immortal Hulk because it was just so perfect. Um, but I do, I do know how I want to do that. So instead of, instead of going all the way in on the black science elements that they explored in Immortal, we're doing more of like a movie monster, like old school Marvel monster kind of approach. And to include even, I really like some of the, the way the old books were kind of like monster of the month kind of thing, or sometimes like a two month arc. I really love that, man. I, I know it's not typically how it's done these days, but, um, I love it. I, I want to see more and more of those. There is going to be a like an, an umbrella kind of arc that that ties the whole thing together, but there are going to be there, the story. The arc is going to be nothing but jumping on points, just constant jumping on points. Very much the way like Ice Cream Man has done as a kind of an anthology series. Like there are little things that you see from issue to issue. You can pick up any one issue of Ice Cream Man and just just read it and love it and put it back. Not put it back, not on the shelf. <laughs> put it down, I should say, in your home after you bought it, folks. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, I just I wanted a series more like that, you know. So that's what that's what they're letting me do. Uh, and you know, Andrew wanted to know: Did Marvel come to you with this pitch, or did you go to them with this? They came to me, and I um, well, just for the pitch, like asking me for a pitch, basically. I see. Go um, on. Yeah. I had I was just drowning in work, and I was um, I actually had recently given up my beloved Alien. I I really love Alien, and it was it was a heartbreak to to stop doing the book, 
but we had done three solid arcs that I was very proud of. Um, and we were deciding what to do next. And um, I was kind of stressing about how I was going to make it all work with the workload. And uh, in the end, I was like, man, I don't know. I think it's been a couple of years. I think I should probably step away. And it was hard to say. It was hard to put it down. It really was. Um, I'm, a, I'm the biggest alien fan. But I did it. I'm like, OK, I'm going to have a little more breathing room now. <laughs> and then they were like, you want to do Hulk? And um, I was like, damn, dude, I don't know. I, I really don't know if I have time. But I, I just I figured out a way to make it work because I I mean, I, I immediately saw the opportunity. So I was like, if they let me do this this is what I would want to do. I would want it to be, I want to see more Immortal Hulk, but in the, in the vein of like the, you know, the more monstrous, not like there weren't enough monsters in Immortal Hulk, but more of like a, almost like a, an like a, um, eldritch horror kind of take. And like, what if we did like an eldritch horror, kind of like a cosmic horror type take on, on Hulk and on that whole side of the Marvel mythology, like just really explore and celebrate the monsters in the Marvel universe and also kind of do it where, you know, bring out elements of the old show where he's kind of wanted to be out, you know, in the aftermath of the events of Donnie and Ryan's run, it would kind of make sense to me for Hulk to kind of be on the run again, the way he was in the old TV show and just kind of having adventures here and there. Um, what if we had a story like that, like across the American South, at least to start, you know, and there are all these opportunities for really cool, creepy, gothic stories some of which would explore um, my favorite monsters from the Marvel U that already are out there, but also a bunch of original stories, like original monsters that I'd like to introduce. I mean, we've all seen we've all seen mummies, we've all seen vampires and werewolves and the usual stuff. Um, there's more opportunities to tell to make new kinds of monsters, I guess. That's always kind of been something I've always been interested in in comics. To include my first ever finished comic, The Lost Boys of the U Boat Bremen, that was like a period horror piece with a new kind of monster. I just, that began as a zombie story. I was like, why am I messing with zombies? We've already got plenty of that. Um, so just creating new kinds of monsters for comics has always been super fun, super rewarding. And I think it lends itself to Marvel super well. That's great, man. And um, de designing the newer monsters, is that something you and Nick did together? I mean, did you discuss what you what you were going for? And That's you know, what we're doing, yeah. Yeah. I, so great. I mean, right now, it's still so early in the run. I mean, we've we're only just just getting started so a lot of these things exist only in my own mind still um it's not like a team where they all show up right now so i've only seen a few of these creatures so far on you know on paper and ink um but i god i can't wait to see the next one i am bringing out um some different takes on marvel monsters that exist and i think people can be pretty stoked for some of these that's great um, man. i mean that was the generation before the heroes all those wonderful kirby and Lee, uh, you know, created, you know, Mongor and all those those great names that Stan would come up with them, but those really amazing designs. But it's interesting to see that maybe we'll get a new spin on some of those classic uh, monster designs. Right. Yeah. And sometimes there's all these really fun ones that just kind of show up very briefly and are super dope. And then you don't see them again. Like they just show up for, a, you know, one or two issues. Sometimes they stay kind of obscure and then they just go nowhere. It would be really fun for me to find some of those and bring them out and flesh them out and give them this backstory. As everyone knows, I, I love world building and I've got um, kind of putting together this this family tree of of Marvel monsters and how like what ties them all together and where they all come from and how what Hulk's place and all that could be, especially as it applies to the stuff that Al and Joe did on Immortal. Like there's uh, the whole aspect of the green door um, will still play a part. Good to hear. Absolutely. Um, Alex Sanchez, just uh, some praise. Love you, man. Always pick up your titles uh, every, every week that they come out. Thanks, brother. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, this is hilarious. Taylor, Taylor Winter goes, why does the client hate short hair on men? Yeah, Bruce looking very scraggly in the, uh, if that, and I'm assuming that is Bruce there in the front. Nick and I both um, love metal music. And, uh, we're going with is that when we were first doing the designs for um uh, we text back and forth a lot nick and i text a lot and um nick is a musician as as i am and uh i thought man wouldn't it be cool if he was talking about long-haired hulk and then i saw it and i was like wow that's actually pretty cool i said something like i i envisioned him with a beard i was like would you want to try him with a beard and he just said no 
<laughs> ah. and, and the more I thought about it, the more we kind of checked it out. He was talking about the, um, about the, how easy it would be to shave versus getting haircuts on the road, like living the kind of life that he's living. And, and, um, and also just kind of, the more I sat with it, I was like, I think I do like that better. It's, and just with the, just the heavy metal kind of overtones that Hulk brings, having a Cobain Bruce Banner and a, uh, a Danzig Hulk kind of makes sense to me. <laughs> so yeah, we're going with Danzig Hulk and I like it. Like I like it best like this. I also think Bruce on the run could cover his identity better, better if he is scraggly looking. I don't know if I've ever seen Bruce with rock and roll hair like that before. I know. That's fantastic. No, I, I like Cobain. it. Kurt Cobain. I love exactly, it. Yeah. That's no, fantastic, like it. man. Nick's Hilarious. got a great plus. I know I really don't like micromanaging artists, especially when they, I mean, because when oh, I sure. said, when I was like, what do you think about a beard? And he was like, nah. And I, that was really all I needed to hear because I don't want him. I want him to draw him the way he wants to see him, you know, unless it was like a big misstep. Um, That's hilarious. And which is not, I think it looks really cool. And, and he, I mean, you almost never see him looking like that. Um, So yeah, no, I, I really like it. Well, DC patrol is excited and uh, Ben seems to be excited as well. And says, uh, <laughs> the Hulk can never be as short as Danzig. Very funny. I didn't know Danzig was short. Yeah. That's, funny. Short. That's pretty cool. Um, Oh, and I'm sorry. So Jared wants, or pardon me, Justin. Excuse me, Justin. Hi, Phil. I love your War World arc in action. Any classic Hulk villains we should expect to see? And again, without spoiling. So why don't you just make that a yes or no question, Phil? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave it there. There's. Uh, I am. I'm really excited. I, honestly, I would love to just to just create nothing but new stuff this whole time. But I do. I know that uh, that long term, that long time fans of a thing like to like to get rewarded for that, you know, as I do. And it's, I just, I think it'd be really fun for them to see, you know, either a fan favorite character or just some obscure thing um, that's like, Oh my God, I know who that is. You know, I, I was gonna, there was a specific thing I was going to use. I'll tell you this much. There was one thing I was gonna, I was really excited to use. And then my friend um, David Pepos is using them in the, in the annual, it's going to come out right before that. <laughs> so that's okay. When, when you see what's in there, um, I'm not saying it's not going to happen in my run, but if I do, if I do find a place to use them, I'll have to find, I'll have to find a way to tie it into what David did. Okay. Um, we're not just repeating ourselves, you know? Now, again, I think this is spoiler territory, but at Tom account, I'm going to put your comment in there, uh, just to maybe, uh, and if it's not already in Philip's mind, but given your world building talents, he's hoping that we might see Jarella's world. I'm a big Jarella fan myself. Jarella is pretty cool. Um, uh, I'll just go ahead and say I don't have any plans to yet. I, I hope to be on this book a long time. And um, we do too, man. That that being said, um, there's always a chance it could it could do something like that. Right now, I'm the vision that we have for Hulk right now um, has a has a metal soundtrack, and you're going to see them exploring the American South, just kind of walking the the little side roads and train tracks through the American South, seeing the Gothic sides, like getting getting exposed to monsters and uh, and ghosts and creatures that none of us know are there things that we all kind of just take for granted that for the reasons made clear in the first couple of issues are making themselves known to hulk like hulk is being tied back into the world of monsters in a big way um so that's kind of the vibe i know there's there's there have been other like like space stories with hulk and yeah. um, like interdimensional things with hulk and for right now for right now it's um it's a monster book in a way that lends itself very well to like Southern Gothic type stuff, in my opinion. That so. sounds great. No, and again, the Southwest is uh, classic Hulk territory, and I like the idea that the monsters are kind of uh, chasing him. I, I think that's that's going to be great. Um, Andrew wants to know who your favorite Hulk character is apart from Bruce. Uh, his has been Rick Jones, of course. I like Betty. Betty Ross, yeah, like she's. Um, she's she's been done in a lot of different ways and i to me she's kind of like this thing that haunts him and so seeing that seeing that impact on him is always um is always kind of cool my i mean selfishly my favorite character is a new character we that we introduced here there's a there's new there's a new character for this run that i hope to have um the same the same long lasting impact on the hulk mythology as 
is Betty and Rick and uh, Doc Samson and, and all the, the usual suspects. There's a new character that I really love that I, I hope will stick around for a long time, that I hope will outlive me, you know, whether it be in a Hulk book or someplace else. Um, character much like a lot of people I've known and that I have a lot of affection for. I, I What is in comics currently... What is Thunderbolt Ross's? Is he dead? Is he, you know, what? Where, what's his status these days? Um, last I heard, he was dead. Um, but I, ah. I think it's a little complicated because there was the, you know, the Red Hulk stuff was all part of the end of Immortal. Um, I'd forgotten that. Yeah, I could, I could be, I might be showing my ass here. Hopefully, forgive me if I'm speaking at a turn if I'm making a mistake. But I, because I want to say that he's dead, but I also I know that. Like since since his death, it's kind of become a thing that Hulks don't die now. So I'm I'm not 100 percent sure, but I, he's um, last I heard he's dead. Now some people, and actually I'm going to conflate a couple of people asking, uh, but some people were asking if other classic Marvel heroes, without spoiling, might show up in your run. But uh, DC Patrol says too. I never read the Hulk until the last Johnny Cates run. I like the idea of the character, but I'm afraid of all the Marvel tie-ins and crossovers. I hope this uh, stays solo. You know, I um, I know that one of the one of the ways that you see the like the when the big two assign an event to someone, that's a that's a real sign of of faith in that in that creator, uh, like of trust, and like the, they're becoming one of the the architects of that myth, of that mythology, um, and that's awesome. I personally. Um, do not have a lot of, I don't know. I shouldn't say that. I mean, there are, there are big event stuff I would like to do at some point, especially the, some of the ideas that we introduced in war world saga. There is an event I would love to do with that. Um, but, but generally um, what I have in mind for this story is just a, is just one monthly book that continues in a singular direction and becomes this, becomes this tome of Hulk that like becomes a, like a substantial piece of his history. I hope that's what happens here. I'm not really, I don't really need it to be a World War Hulk thing that crosses over the entire thing. Um, there is um, there is an idea in the in the basic pitch of, of Hulk that could potentially blow out and become a much bigger thing, in which case we'd have to see if we go over into the other series. But um, but not, I don't know, I don't think it needs that. And I, I would also be completely fine if it stayed solo. Um, I just want to, I just want to make great work, man. I don't need it. I don't need, uh, I don't need my um, my writerly ambitions to to bleed over into the work of other people's series. Um, I'd be content to just do the one series. So yeah, I, it it would work totally fine solo, and it will probably end up that way. Uh, Sub Nero eighty nine wants to know if we'll see some of the other Hulk personalities like Savage Hulk, Joe Fixit, <laughs> World Breaker, Devil Hulk, etc. You already heard me talk about Joe Fixit and everything. Maybe. Um, mostly, mostly, we're going to be dealing with. Okay, I, I really liked how Hulk spoke and acted in Planet Hulk. Um, for me, the, the baby talk stuff sometimes gets in the way, um, depending, on the, depending on the context of what's happening in the story. And the, um, the take um, of this run, like it, I probably should have led with this, um, but Hulk in this story is not... Like he and he and uh, Banner are not getting along exactly. In fact, this is more of like a, a horror movie kind of take where Bruce is on the run trying to escape Hulk. Hulk is stalking him, the way that you see in movies like The Ring or It Follows, things like that. He's this thing that comes out at the worst times. The Hulk is um, has makes such an easy metaphor for so many different kinds of things. Um, I mean, Stan has talked about the you know, Frankenstein, Jekyll and Hyde stuff. Um, people commonly say that he's, you know, he's my rage, my controllable rage. Like whenever I get angry, I feel like I just lose control and become this monster. That's the thing that people have said. I think it makes a very convenient uh, metaphor for addiction. And um, that to me is, yeah, that's something that I find the most interesting, I guess. Like where it's, you know, the whole, like, what did I do last night kind of thing where it takes over and everything breaks. Um, for me, the truest and most relatable Hulk story is the one about the struggle in everybody between their best selves and their worst compulsions. Um, the person that wants what's best for them, that pursues the things that they want with big goals and big dreams, 
And then the person that kind of gets in their own way all the time, right? Like if only I could stop, you know, overeating or if only I could stop playing video games, or if only I could um, just stick to my, stick to my goals and do the thing that I have to do. If only I could, if I was a better student or if I wasn't late to work all the time or whatever, it's all these things. Like, why did I say that to her? You know, like these things that get in your own way and break the things that you want. Um, that's what this is. So instead of the Hulk coming out when, when Bruce gets angry, he's this thing that stalks Bruce now where he's, he's angry, Bruce. He wants to take over Bruce's body. He wants, he wants to just, he wants to just completely take over and just push Bruce out, lock him away the way that Bruce locked Hulk away in the, in the Donnie and Ryan run. Um, so now instead of coming out when he's angry, Hulk's coming out when he gets a moment's peace. Like if Bruce is feeling at, at ease, if he's feeling comfortable, if he makes a friend, if somebody is kind to him, if he's, uh, you know, if he has a moment to rest, Hulk comes out and destroys everything. Like that's the, he, wow. uh, he kind of like has this crazy, crazy body horror transformation that we see on the page in the way that we haven't really seen in a lot of the other books. We saw some of that in the, in Immortal, but I, I love the body horror imagery. I want to see, I want to see his fingernails, like the Hulk's fingernails ripping out of Bruce's fingers. I want to see his bones like popping out a joint and the, the Hulk's like enormous teeth pushing out his other teeth and like his skull cracking and reforming and this, this hideous body horror transformation where this thing comes out and then Bruce wakes up and hours have passed and he's lying in this gigantic puddle of green bile with like a half eaten deer in it. And he's like, what happened and he looks over and there's this burning building and a dog barking at him and like he's just constantly on the run from this thing that just invades his body breaks everything around and makes him run again so that's, that's i want it to awesome. be like a, like a, a scary story about a guy that's afraid of the thing that's inside of him the way that all of us are to some degree folks respectfully i'm looking at the chat and some comments are things that uh philip has already covered so uh if you felt like your question wasn't answered I would suggest you rewind because a lot of this stuff has been covered, like favorite past Hulk runs, uh, to, as an immediate example, Zach, things like that. So rather than have Philip repeat himself, I would rather uh, move on to other uh, other possibilities. And um, Matt makes an interesting uh, observation, but clearly this is in your run. He says Bruce Banner is the monster, not the Hulk. Well, it doesn't yeah. look like Philip is going to point in that direction. Not this time, yeah. Sadly, <laughs> no. Hulk is very much the monster. About a lot of these characters, they are malleable enough that you can have a different take like that. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I mean, that, that's, that's the thing. That was the that was the take in the in the most recent run, and I respect it. I thought it was really cool, very creative, and I think Bruce is uh, he is more. He's so intelligent. He becomes scary in that in that book, and he has found a way to to lock Hulk away in a way that sets everything wrong. So and. This is the story after that one in which Hulk is after his revenge against Bruce. I get it. Absolutely. Ben Hayes uh, says, damn, I still want to see a TV show with your body horror Hulk and hear the metal soundtrack. Yeah, that'd be great, man. Yeah, man. We'll Absolutely. see. Uh, some people were worried uh, given uh, the level of Marvel work lately. They want to make sure you're staying on action for, uh, you know, uh, oh, yes. a good period of time. That's and everything. A, so they're a little worried a, about that. That's a from my cold dead hands situation. Like I, Superman means a lot to me. Like I, I'm not giving up Superman ever. Like they'll, at some point they'll, look, at some point it's going to happen on DC and Marvel both like to move around creative teams, um, whether because they have big plans for a specific voice on a specific title and they just need to, they need to, you know, use their resources wisely. Um, sometimes to, you know, give sales a boot in the ass on, a, on one title or another. Um you know, it's just something that happens. So I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna throw throw up a fit when that happens. But well, I might a little bit behind the scenes. <laughs> I'll see what I can, I'll see what I can get away with. But I really want to stay on Superman for a long time. I, I would love to have a long, long run on Superman. Well, and you I'm guys thinking. are just getting started with uh, with the story and everything. My God, I mean, the <laughs> world was this massive epic, but now that Superman is back on Earth, uh, no. And and seriously, man, thank you. You you and DC have been kind. And keeping me abreast of what's happening in action and everything. And I love this Metallo story. I think it's fantastic. Thank you, man. Uh, I'm, I'm having such a great time with it. I love that character. Them letting me do, do what I want with him has been so exciting. And we're, <laughs> we are, um, 
we're teeing up the next villain that kind of comes out of organically comes out of that series. And we're doing a cool thing with him over the summer. The, um, the idea of family continues to be important in that one. I'm, I'm trying to let, let the Superman book focus on Superman himself and deal more with uh, the super twins and John and, and Kenan and, and Connor and everybody in the, yeah. in the other book. And I love, I love that we have the backups. They get to explore some of these other characters. Um, Supergirl and uh, young young John Kent when he was still a kid. Yeah, and Power Girl. And all, yeah, those are those stories have been really fun to see, and I just I love the whole nature of what action is right now. It's the Superman family book. I mean, I remember right. that uh, in my uh, late grade school years, buying the Dollar Comic uh, and yeah. enjoying that book and all the different features. No man, and really, I love your scenes. That really, it, the Kent's house has never been more full. And you really great get these great domestic, you know, dialogue moments between you know the the, the kids now uh, who are the new the newcomers, and you know, kind of a great uh, audience point of view if they don't know their classic Superman, you know, history and everything. Um, yeah, and then John Iron's daughter and everybody that's there and everything just kind of commenting on the on the status quo. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's really fun, and that's going to continue. The whole the family through line is going to be the thing that kind of ties the the different arcs together from from arc to arc. Um, there's going to be a really cool thing happening in the fall that tie my tie my um, my run more directly to Josh's. Like they, there's a very specific character that's in both books that has an important arc coming up. Um, yeah, it's just the best, man. I with um with uh, John getting his own book now and some other plans that we have for some of the backups, I'm going to try to spread the love around as far as who gets the most FaceTime in the, in the pages of the main series. Um, but you know, that's part of the fun of it. It's like part of the challenge of working in big two comics is that it's not, you know, it's such a big sandbox. Not all the toys are, well, none of the toys are yours, but you, there's different creators using some of them too at the same time and making sure everyone gets, gets what they need. I guess Riley has a good question. Apparently, maybe the uh, uh, advanced solicits have already said that uh, Cyborg Superman is coming. Kind of makes sense with Metallo and everything, uh, if uh, that's that's the next big bad. But he wants to know what you think makes uh, Hank Henshaw, Cyborg Superman, a good Superman foe. Well, in that case, um, in the case of Cyborg Superman, I think the, the reflection is mostly visual. I mean, the fact that he's a guy, this is a guy who has taken... Um, Superman's DNA and crafted uh, a partially Kryptonian body and just made a kind of a mockery of it, you know? So it's, whereas um, somebody like Bizarro is, you know, thinks he's a hero and is trying to do the right thing. He's like the, he's like the twisted version of a, of a great hero. Brainiac is kind of like the evil version of that thing where he has taken, he's taken what uh, Superman's own body and twisted it into this disgusting thing that just, I mean, punishes Superman through murder. You know, he just like he just he sets he's just this, you know, just this satanic force that just destroys just for the case of the just for destruction for its own sake, and wearing Superman's face as a way to punish him. You know, so he's his he's his truest opposite in that way. He just he, he murders just as a way to get back at, at the, this other person that he blames for this thing. I love how you folded John Irons into uh, Metallo's origin as well that it really was kind of a combination of uh, john's efforts and luther's efforts that created metallo yeah i can't take credit for that sadly that actually came from grant's run oh I yeah know. And the, the, the new 52 stuff um it showed um it showed like metallo shows up in that arc he's a soldier so whenever i refer to him as sergeant corbin and all that stuff that was all um you see um irons as a um a contractor uh, like a, like a DOD contractor that's trying to help them develop this war suit kind of thing. And um, Cor John Corbin is the guy that's wearing it. And then things kind of in that particular story, I think he is, he is uh, mind controlled by, he ends up getting taken over by Brainiac and used as a, as a pawn for somebody else. <clears throat> but that, it shows Brainiac's new 52 origin, excuse me, sorry, Metallo's new 52 origin in that, in that arc. Oh, okay. Uh, I wanted to give little give little nods to that to that arc in the in the pages of action. One of your uh, buddies, uh, Jimmy Little, or uh, here, yeah, and he says, uh, oh, "I love me some Hulk." That's great. Uh, and also, Jimmy's uh, a great dude. Jimmy Jimmy is our um, 
he's like our lighting and tech guy in the band. He's on tour. Oh, right that's now. great, man. Oh, yeah. there you go. On the road. Very good. You know, you know, bug him in his hotel room after uh, after this. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, Sub uh, Sub Nero has a uh, question regarding uh, Hulk. You mentioned the Green Door will play a role in this new run. Does that mean we will be seeing the Below Place again, as well as the One Below All? Shouldn't say. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, I don't want to get into it too deep. I mean, honestly, yeah, I don't even know the yeah. answer myself. It's there are there is um, there are common threads between Al's run and what I have coming, and um, it will at least that stuff will at least come up. But as far as how big a presence it'll have in the run, I don't know. That that will happen down the road if it did happen. But okay, I don't know. Uh, our our Burrow Snake wants to know: Do you think Lobo is a Superman villain? Uh, Lobo is kind of complicated. Um. Yeah, I don't know. It's a gray area, right? He's been you've, you've seen you've seen him do bad things and good things. So yeah, he's you know like Namor. He could be an he could be a a villain at the moment, or he could be an antihero. And we've seen him work alongside Superman, and we've seen them fight each other. And yeah, sure. He just kind of does what he wants. Uh, a, a a character that left the control of Keith Giffen, who thought he was making a joke, and instead makes a classic DC hero since his initial appearance in the 90s and i don't i don't know if uh as much as i'm i'm sure uh, keith appreciates whatever royalties he gets from lobo i also think it's like what have i wrought you know <laughs> <laughs> right so zach good question or good uh, observation i didn't know philip you were catching crap for this but your take on lois and clark's relationship has been enjoyable they seem more real they're not boring which they shouldn't be no man again they're trying to get the kids to bed and the dialogue and everything that's happening that's that's classic, you know, again, raising kids and everything. And they, yeah. they comfortably fit those roles as father and mother. Thanks. I think what he means is the the costume in the closet, probably. <laughs> There's a there was a um, yeah, I've been trying to show how in love they are and how into the how into each other they still are. Um, so I introduced a place called Sunrise Point, um, which is a place above the metropolis skyline, kind of out in the, like way out in the distance where they can see the whole city and the mountains beyond and the ocean and everything. And the sun and the sunrise hits Metropolis, kind of like the Grand Canyon. Like it just becomes, it's just an amazing vista and because they're so high off the ground and so out of the way they can see everything, but nobody can see them. And they go up there to, to fool around sometimes. And they, you know, they're a married couple. They're still, they're still super duper in love. And uh, Superman kind of keeps his eye on the eye on the kids, you know, in their room with his x-ray vision and all that. And they just kind of hang out up there. That's their place to hang out. You know, it's just their their space where they just instead of just sitting on the couch in the living room, they go out and you know over the skyline and just kind of waller in each other. You know, and there was a yeah, a, it was a little nod to all the people that that uh, that like that appreciated the the war world costume that they really liked seeing Superman in in the John Carter you know slash He Man kind of armor, um, just that pulp sci fi kind of thing. Oh yeah. Um, and I, I have a scene where John is looking around for board games and opens up his mom's closet and that, and that suit is still in there <laughs> and little role play. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whatever. So, <laughs> um, and then Lois like slams the door closed, like, Hey, what are you looking for something, sweetie? And John, exactly. John's like, Oh my God, my parents have sex. That's gross. And there was, there, there was like some, some prude troll online got very butthurt about it. Um, but it's fine. It's yeah, fine. whatever. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Jeez. That's what it, that's what they meant. And I, um, yeah, okay. it's fun. They're like some one of the hottest couples in comics. They're yeah. super in love. I guess I don't feel sorry about it. No, I'm with you, man. And also, I've appreciated the evolution of Lois's looks over the decades, literally. And uh, no, I I think Lois again, she is the most fascinating person in the world of Superman. Yeah. That is Lois's uh, superpower. And he he just is amazed by her as this incredibly accomplished woman, and everything about her—her her beauty and her smarts and everything. Every and and yeah. he, he's she's his she's his best friend. She's his uh, confessor that he can go to and say, "I don't know if I'm doing this right." Yeah, and he's his moral Super, compass. She's so powerful, and I I really admire how how what a strong character she is on the page and. It's uh that's that's the character that has come the furthest way for me, like from the old comics to now. The way that she was treated back in the day, where Superman was kind of playing like pranks on her all the time, like haha, oh, yeah. she has no idea. And now it's a whole different ballgame, and she's a very different character. And 
she's she's great. You know, and that was the great thing about the seventies run, where essentially Lois was saying like it was payback for those Weisinger years, where it's like you know, fuck you, I'm your own, I'm my own woman, I don't need you, and I don't need you saving me all the time. I'm I'm I can handle it myself. And and really, to the writers' credits, and I think to the audience's credit, that's the lowest that we want, and we're finally getting it and everything. And also, Riley, I love this this point he's making. Uh, I love the scene of Otho and Osel in the apartment with the glasses. I do too. Could either of them wear their own pair in the future? And will they publicly be Kents with their own civilian names? That's a good question. That is a good question. Um, one I've already thought about, and I'm not sure yet. Like right now, the the story that we're telling is so like we have we need a certain amount of bandwidth to get to where we're going. There's only so many pages in a book, so we haven't. Um, I do try to seed in these very personal, like real life moments where they're trying to get used to life on Earth. There's a there's a big moment coming where one of them takes a big misstep coming up soon. Um, we have to kind of figure out what to do with the kids, and I um like right now there are all making them Kents when they're still so clearly not of earth in their culture and the way that they act. I feel like it's a little too soon. I feel like it would be, yeah. it, would, it would give away the secret identity thing right now that that's, that's back in the bottle. We need to protect that. So I'm not sure yet how that's going to be dealt with, but I would really like it actually, if Otho specifically is wearing glasses after that conversation, um, that would be, that'd be kind of neat. So I probably will do that. So that. When you see you're in glasses, that's why. That's awesome. Aaron uh, says, I've always wanted to see the Hulk and Mangog clash. I think it'd be <laughs> interesting as they enjoy smashing puny gods. Umar of the Dark Dimension, of course, and Zorn could be great for Mystic Horror. I'm a big Umar fan myself. Wow. Oops. Yeah, I'm just going to ruminate on that. Exactly, man. No, no, no. And that's the thing. Listen, you know, a lot of the audience like, well, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And it's like, yeah. And so many of these people in this chat, too, like, no, have such a great knowledge of this stuff. I yeah. am so I remember going to my first my first ever comic convention and just see there was a panel with I can't remember who all was on. I the only person I remember on the panel was Ramada Senior. Um let's see. Actually, yeah, his actually JRJR might have been on it too. There's a bunch of like a bunch of the old guard Marvel guys were on it. I don't remember if if it was just Ramada Senior or if it was both of them, but anyway, they um they were so they were on the panel and somebody was asking questions about um about various people and it was <laughs> it was funny seeing the differentiation of uh like how much more how, like the the audience knew all the issue numbers and the pages they're talking about like if you refer back to fantastic four number 14 page six and um they knew a lot of stuff better than better than the creators and and at some point, Ramada said something like, somebody asked him who he, if there's anybody he liked drawing or didn't like drawing. He's See, like, who? And he said something like, what's the guy with the, the bump for a head? I can't remember his name. And he's just a, just the, the, the bump head guy. And he's looking around. The, and the other people in the panel is like, I don't know. Somebody's like, juggernaut? And he's like, yeah, juggernaut. I hate that. <laughs> and he was, you know, just a, a pretty, pretty, a name people know who like Marvel comics. It was just so fun to see how, how not precious they were about those little details. As, uh, dude, I so feel the same way. And some of the podcast, some of my fellow podcasts just drive me nuts where, and I've said this to Howard Chicken and he busted out laughing. I'm like, they treat creators like the Keebler elves and the characters too is so precious. And really you go back to those uh, silver age guys. And I'm sure the golden age guys are the same way or it's like, I don't know the guy the the guy that has no face. The question, yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly, you know, right, exactly. Like, yeah, and I mean, and and you do you love that about them? Where it's just like, yeah, whatever. What, else, what am I getting paid for this week? Fantastic. Yeah, I saw I saw some video of Jim Henson handling some of the Muppets, uh, like the actual dolls that they're using, and just treating them like junk, kind of like the original stuff. <laughs> and he just he had no precious like they, they, he didn't treat it like you know these holy relics the way a lot of the way i myself would you know i uh, dude i'm an og sesame street viewer was there for season one i was a little kid and everything and it blew my mind and mm -hmm. i agree with you have you ever watched they're on youtube from the 50s these black and white film commercials of henson's early earliest muppets like even pre-ralph and they would do these commercials for salmon friends 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, and he was, and yeah, he they did these commercials in college, right? Like just these super short, super short commercials that were like seconds long. Yeah, fifteen seconds or whatever. Yeah, seconds. yeah, man. Honestly, it was like five. It was like just ridiculously short. Big. Yeah, and they they were really had to be really creative about how to even get the thing out in the amount of time that they had. It was like it was really funny. Uh, Gavin, oh, you know, and uh, one other story, but forgive me. Like uh, in that same panel with the Rama, is I I can't remember if it was both of them or just him, but um, I always. My brother and I would call JRJR. We call him Junior Junior, kind of for like in short sure. when we're talking about comics. And I want to say Ramada, someone in the chat, I'm certain will is able to correct me. I want to say that Ramada said he himself is a junior and that JRJR oh, is actually that's a, a third. I'm not sure if that's true. I don't know. That's it. That's no. whatever. I love Johnny. Johnny's a, I, that's my JRJR abbreviation. It's just Johnny to me. Uh -huh. and, and again, especially being a fellow John and stuff. And he has always been kind, and I, as I'm sure he is to, to many fans and stuff, but the opportunities I've had to interview him and uh, just running into him at, at shows and stuff, he always he always is so warm to me. And it was it was sweet. Uh, and, of course, now Senior is so old, and I would never, you know, impose on his privacy and everything. But back back in the day, I'm like, you know, Johnny, your dad turned me down. He's like, well, get it, don't worry. Don't worry, John. We'll get him. I'll work on him. I'll work on him. So and it meant a lot that he even would say that to me and stuff. So no, I that family, they're amazing. And of course, Virginia, the mom, you know, was the was the woman uh, in charge of payroll at oh, Robert yeah. back in the day and stuff. So it's like this whole family business. I and heard that, yeah. Yeah. And they don't, you know, the, the the parents and stuff, it's like, oh, that's cute. Johnny's doing his thing. That's lovely. You know, whatever. It's like <laughs> I love his, that about that. Johnny's drawing his cartoons. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Ramada was JRJR was one of the first people I ever like actually checked to see who drew a thing. I remember back then it was just it's just Spider-Man comics. It's whatever. I, I I was reading for the character, not any of the creators. I was, you know, all the same to me. And you know, of course, there was kind of a house style, but there was one, but every now and then there was one of those issues that really stood out. Like it was it was still a house style, but like the tippy top shelf version of that thing. And for I me, remember I remember a couple of times looking and it was it was Ramada Jr. For me, it was his Daredevil. I just yeah. his Daredevil was so exciting and dramatic. And I'm like, who's drawing that? And it's like, oh, yeah, right. Jack. I'm like, oh, cool. Good for him. You know, yeah. and, and it, hey, uh, Jack Nicholas uh, Jr., not the greatest golfer. You know, I mean, it's it's <laughs> not it's not a given that the talent will suddenly like fall to the sun. The Cuberts are a wonderful exception oh, like yeah. that as well. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's, that's one guy. I'm usually I really have a hard time ever uh, bothering any any old guard creators that are at con or something. I just don't want to bother them because I know people people are like falling at their feet all day long, and I I feel weird um, piling on that. So I never I've I've been in the same room as Frank Miller like dozens of times, and I never talked to him because I still want to bother. No. And but I I do wish I'd spoken to Joe Kubert. I Joe Kubert, man, the sun rises and, and sets. Uh, with Kubert for me. I just, I respect that guy so much and his work and the legacy left behind. I really wish I'd met Joe Kubert. Paul Miotti and Amanda Connor introduced me to Joe directly. And I had a couple really nice conversations with him at conventions off hours before he passed away. I, I regret not having him on word balloon. We had discussed it in principle and I love his real comic book history that uh, his old, uh, studio mate and collaborator at many uh, St. John's comics of the 50s, those 3D comics, was Norman Maurer. And Norman was uh, the son-in-law of uh, Mo Howard of the Three Stooges fan. And in fact, Norman took over managing and producing for the Stooges in their final years of activity from the late 50s till the early 70s. And uh, I did interview Norman back in the day, and I, that was one of my ends to talk to Joe was like, oh, man, I go, you know, I only knew Norman as uh, as the Stooges' son-in-law and, and, and manager, and I wish I had known more about his comics because I would have gone on for hours. And he's like, oh, my God, when I'd go to Mo's house, he was all business. You wouldn't even think he was a comedian. He was so serious all the time. And, and just great stories like that. And I asked him about the Fairley Brothers, Stooges movie, because, you know, they did the Three Stooges comic book, Norman and, and Joe. Uh, I didn't know that. No. Yeah, the 3D comic book back in the 50s and stuff. So yeah, I mean that's that's a great thing. I mean, I, I you know, and also I had like war comics and uh Christ, I can't even remember the artist that I couldn't um place. And uh it was it was a war comic and I'm like, I know this isn't Ross Eath. I know it's not you. 
and like within five seconds, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, of course it is. Yes, thank you. You know, he, he was the man. And truly, what a great career. I mean, not only as an artist, but as an editor as well, and a great writer. And I, I'm thrilled that literally till the day he died, Joe Kubert was making exciting new comic books. Yeah. It, it, what a what a career what a life yeah i have what, yeah what? i have a i have a sergeant rock book that he did towards the very end and it looked terrific i mean super good you had man that's that's the dream right to be doing you still be doing your best work like your whole life 100 percent, man absolutely um uh oh first of all and i want to go back to it because i gotta find him on here where the hell was he shame on me all right let's see am i scrolling scrolling where the hell is he all right, I'm gonna have to find him on the next uh, round. I'm no, sorry, okay. I'll, I'll get him. I'll get him. Uh, uh, let's see here. Oh, um, RP Chatham wants to know: Do you think you could juggle another big title like Amazing Spider-Man along with Hulk in action? I know there are fans, but I think uh, the Amazing Spider-Man title needs a fresh uh, face, so to speak. Would you ever want to do Spider-Man? That's super kind of you to ask. I um, I know some. I know there's been some big stuff happening on Amazing Spider-Man and making some noise, but I um, I am pretty tapped out for books right now. <laughs> I uh, it, it's more like if I take on any more, it's not gonna it's not gonna be my best work at all. So I I think I need to stick with what I'm doing and let some series run their course before I take on anything new. And actually, there's a creator-owned book I want to do. Um, that's already greenlit. I'm trying to get to it. I'm just like they've been great about it, but I'm trying to make time to turn in books on time. Um, so, I mean, I love Spider-Man and I think that he's another one with um, a really great and clear mission statement the way a lot of characters do. Like the way Superman is, you know, the, you know, the, the, the alien who teaches us how to be human, like the, the one who's just the, the absolute best of us in all times where for me, the mission statement of Superman is the, the powers after, by mission statement, I mean, just, the thing that has to happen in every issue is that it has to be clear that I want to see like the, the biggest, craziest expression of his powers possible, but only to illustrate how incorruptible he is. It's that whole absolute power, but absolute humility thing that has to be there in every issue. I want to see him do something visually just unbelievably stunning and, you know, godlike power, but only, but also be chased with like, show why he is completely incorruptible and cares about the least of us, you know, to check the kid's seatbelt in the back seat and have this conversation with somebody who like just this little concise one line about how much he cares about someone or some little thing. It can't just be for its own sake ever. Um, the other day um, I was on a, I was on a thing with Chip Zdarsky and he was talking about, he was talking about Spider-Man and he mentioned, I hope Chip didn't, isn't annoyed that I mentioned this, but he, he said, uh, Spider-Man is is summed up in, uh, you know, the thing we all think of is, of course, great power, great responsibility. But he said, can't but must was the way he summed up Spider-Man. And I thought that was so elegantly put. I love it. Yeah, um, man. You know, and you can sum him up in other ways, too. The whole idea about him, like Spider-Man wins, Peter Parker loses or something, you know, that kind oh, of thing. Sure. That, sure. That, that juggling of real life and superheroism. Um. There are those things that you can cut that you can use to, as your as your north star to lead the story. I loved when Bendis put him in the Avengers, and yeah. with the way Bendis put it was that Spider Man didn't think he was worthy to be with these guys, and what he didn't realize was they all saw him as like a pillar of like virtue and like we need to be more like him. Yeah, he was and, the moral center of the team. Yeah, and there was like even. Um, during when Norman had his uh, Dark Avengers and everything, and Hawkeye's like, we got to kill Norman. I was just going to tell you about that. I was thinking that same exact moment. And Spider-Man's like, are you nuts? And it's great because really, like, it's, you know, Peter rarely speaks up, but it's like, we can't do that. That's not who, if we do that, then he wins. Don't you realize that? No, we yeah. His, he's, stay true to the cause, exactly. man. Yeah. In that book, he said, like, it's easy to be a good guy when everything's going good. You know, it's hard, you know. You got to be a good guy when you're being tested. We're being tested right now. Yep. And so the best to... when when Norman's trying to be sane, and then the, finally he's got the the goblin uh, paint fa face paint and stuff, and and Peter's like, "See, I told you." 
<laughs> in terms of how nuts he is and stuff. Right. It, it's just no, he, he is. He's uh, he's one of my favorite characters too. And uh, every now and then, the right writer will give him like a big moment, and it's like, uh, okay, I, I always I always give it up to Straczynski for when uh, the Kingpin tried to kill Anne May, and he goes to and uh, Peter goes to the jail, and it's when everyone knows that Peter's Spider Man and stuff. And he beats the shit out of the kingpin. And he's like, do you see what will happen to you if you come after my family? And it's like, you know, Spider-Man with the quips and all that other shit. And it's like, yeah, man. But when the safety is off, he is incredibly dangerous. And it's beautiful. Spider-Man is really great. And I would love to write him. Um, it's going to have to be a long time before that happens. And I would have to really think about what to do. There's so much been done with Spider-Man and so much of it is great. You know, like, what do you do with them? That's a, it's a challenge, man. These stories have been going on for a long time. And um, I, my only experience writing Spider-Man so far has been as the lead of Marvel Zombies Resurrection. And it was a very different take. It was like a Cormac McCarthy's The Road kind of setup where the world is just burned to the ground. Everything sucks and Spider-Man's in charge and everything sucks. And he's like, we see a Spider-Man for the first time who's not his quippy self. He's like sad and angry. And he's like his spider sense is going on like around the clock. So he's got headaches that will probably kill him eventually. And it's, you know, he he gradually becomes the Spider-Man that we all recognize over the course of the series. That's his arc. Is he's this person who's constantly afraid and just like he's constantly afraid, just trying to keep the promise he made to the Richards to keep their children alive. And he's just constantly in, just on edge for years you know he's like this ptsd happening like around the clock and eventually he he remembers what it's like to be himself and to be a superhero and it was so rewarding to see spider-man come up here again you know to see him become to see spider-man emerge on the page um so yeah it was it was an awesome time i'd love to write him someday but um there are other stories where I, I care deeply about the stories we're telling right now i mean there's right now i'm telling stories uh, stories in action about what it means to be what it means, how best to be human, you know, like this is, this is the work I'm, I feel like I'm going to be not to get all morbid, but I feel like this is going to be the work that I'm remembered for. Hopefully like that's what I, that's the idea. That's the goal. I want, the, I want to be remembered for, for the work that we're doing right now on War World Saga and on the Superman run that's been happening since then. Um, Hulk, I think there's something very, is a very important statement that I want to make in Hulk about, um, about the, the thing is that we, the person that we want to be, and then the the version of us that, you know, that prevents that all the time. About that, the uh, you know, our our self that just wants what it wants and and burns down your goals and dreams at every turn. And how do you how do you beat that person? How do you how do you win when the when your enemy is yourself? Um, there's a story I'm telling in in 007 right now, a dynamite about the the nature of patriotism. What happens when the word patriot doesn't mean what it used to, which is one the question I ask myself all the time in real life. You know, I used to call myself patriot. Now there's that word's been co-opted by the worst kind of people. So Agreed. what does that mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, the story of the Green Lantern and that we're gonna be doing a Green Lantern and my creator on, these are all stories that, that matter to me a lot. So um i these are um, stories I'll have to finish telling before I can think about anything else. Has the GL run started yet, Phil, or is it still coming up this spring? Um, I've turned it. No, I've I've turned in my first backup story for for that. Like the actual, there's going to be a three part backup that appears in the pages of Jeremy Adams' Hal Jordan Green Lantern run, and that tees up um, my Green Lantern John Stewart run, which starts in September. Okay, okay, that's great, man. No, we're all excited. You know, honestly, man, the way you described Spider Man and said so many stories have been told that some people might be intimidated. Same can be said for the Hulk and Superman, obviously, and and you have come with a, a, a you know an agenda that you want to do with these characters and stuff, and yeah, that's that's always the most important th thing. Thanks. Yeah. These yeah. these books these books really matter to me. I mean, I know that there are people who see them primarily as books for kids, and they can be. Like I still I read some of these stories to my son, not all of them, <laughs> um, sure, but uh, you know they can be for kids. It doesn't mean they can't also matter. You know, like I go back and read stories that that matter to me as a kid and they still hold up. So I, I'm trying to tell stories that matter. There was a, there was a kid that came up to me at uh, awesome con in DC. Um, and all he had read of my work at that time was the future state issues. He read um, future state Superman worlds of war one and two, and probably house of L as well. And, um, 
And that, that was about, that story was about finding Superman. It was about this girl who was inspired by the writing of Clark Kent. And when she found out that Superman was Clark Kent, she went on this pilgrimage to find where he was from and ends up finding the, the farm and the, the ship that he came here on. It was just this really moving story for her. Um, and that, the, this teenage boy who came to this con, his dad brought him. His parents had just split up. And um, he was taking it super fucking hard, clearly. And uh, his dad was trying to give him a, an escape weekend, you know, so he brought him up to this convention. And he had read that story, and it just it just really spoke to him, man. And he, he talked to me. At, he got really excited talking about it. Like, you get it, man. Like, Superman, this is why he's, you know, he, he told me his own, like, my story aside, he was telling me his manifesto on, on Superman and why he's the best and what people should be and who we should be. And without meaning to, he told me who, who he's going to be. He was telling me, he was telling me who he's aspiring to be now and how that has been shaped by losing everything he had. He felt like his, his whole life got blown up. He lost that security and he had this, he's looking for father figure. He's looking for like direction for his life. And like, what does it all mean? And where am I going to go? Who am I going to be? And uh, just, he found Superman. And that is helping him in his in his real in his real life, you know. And he started crying, and he he came behind the booth. We hugged it out, and it was this really powerful moment, man. Yeah. I will never forget that moment or that kid. And I I know there are other kids like it because I used to be one. Like these stories, I know they're about you know superheroes, and some people just kind of dismiss it as cartoons. But I to me, this job is just this unbelievable opportunity to to help. To help people be who they want to be, and to help people show people what we're all supposed to be, you know. Yeah, moral compass, and no, I've, yeah. do, uh, I do. I'm sure we have said this before to each other. If not, um, the Julie Schwartz edited era of the '70s of Superman and that Kurt Swan Superman, who, frankly, when Kurt was drawing him, he looked like he was maybe in his mid 40s. He mm -hmm. was much more of a, as far as appearance, much more of a father figure. And uh, no, I that's why I give it up to Marty Pasco and. Uh, Carrie Bates and Elliot Magan, because they were my Superman writers. And, and yeah, I, I, you know, I still had my father and everything, but no, he was a great inspiration of, of how to, how to lead your life. So no, I absolutely get it. And also there's just the, yes, these things are made for, um, you know, starting with maybe a, an adolescent audience, but I think uh, as I, as I cling to my last years of middle age, uh, <laughs> it's great escapism. And and there's nothing wrong with that. I there are certain uh, pop culture critics out there who are on TV who criticize adults that dress up for Halloween or that they enjoy the Marvel movies a little too much. Oh my and god! Like, and again, it's it's just yeah, fuck off. It's escape. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's well, entertainment. Look past the pretty pictures and listen to the stories are being told. Like these are about you know if you yeah if you the the people who like you know, get so attached to their characters and then, you know, bully and attack and complain online about how, you know, you're doing it wrong. A character's not blonde anymore or something like, man, look packs, look past the pictures and listen to the goddamn story and try to take from it what we're all supposed to take from it. I so you agree. Know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Gavin Guidry. I'm sorry, Gavin. I've been needing to uh, put your comments up. He, first of all, he wants to know when you guys are going to work together again. <laughs> Gavin's a great yeah, artist. Yeah, we, we table next to each other. Yeah. It's, well, it's and he was wondering if you're going to be at uh, AwesomeCon this year. I don't know, actually. I need to check. I should. I I don't know. Shit. Kind of kind of got a gun to my head here. I will um I will find out tomorrow. I think I'm sure they'll let me. I just gotta find out when the dates are and everything. Well, and again, it's not only your writing schedule and everything else, but it's the army as well. Yeah, well, that's well, what I mean. Yeah, I, well, I realize I had that. A, if only I had a device in front of me that could answer any question. Let me just look it up right now while we're talking. Okay. And uh, while um, you're 16th to 18th, you know, yeah, I could probably do that. I think. Yes, I could probably do that. I go on tour wow. the following. I go on tour the following week. Um. Oh, here, Lewis Headache uh, wants you to know he really appreciates Clark and Lois's writing. For example, A Life Well Lived by Clark from Future State and Winds of Change by Lois uh, in action. Please do more. Oh, thanks so much, man. Yeah, um, a life well lived. That was a, an op-ed that Clark Kent wrote in the pages of the Daily Planet. Um, that is being read on the page while we see what Clark is actually doing in the war world. 
So thanks very much. I really love writing writing Clark and Lois's writing. Um, if I could, uh, as an editor, if I can offer myself notes, I need to make their writing styles more distinct from each other. Okay, um, okay. No, but I do, I, do try to do. Huh? I appreciate that though, because yeah, I, um, the, you know, again, sometimes depending on who's writing Superman, they don't do enough of showing uh, Clark's writing skills. Yeah, and I do like exactly. that about him, and it's like, you know, and also I always say too, he's not Batman, but he is an investigative reporter, and right. he has worth as Clark Kent, and that, and again, and we, you know, we've we've covered it before. As much as I appreciated Bendis's run and the identity being exposed, I do like it that it's kind of back, and in fact, I think in part of that conversation you have with the kids and the glasses, you really get into the importance of Clark Kent in, in super, Superman's life. And it's more than just a guy's and it's, you know, it's, it really is, you know, a, a part of, it, it's a big part of who he is. It is. Yeah. I think it's, I thought it was an, an important thing to address in the, in the returning to the secret identity. Um, there are most writers, I will, I will say most writers and, and artists see, um, don't give Twitter a lot of weight like if, if somebody gets if they get trolled on Twitter or something there it's like they don't care it's not it's not real you know smart um, yeah it is um, but I do I do value places like that online for just kind of get put my finger on the pulse of the readership like find people that I feel like sure. actually read it that don't just get pissed because because they're because they like to but who are actually reading the story and and um, and care about the characters I try to look for that for those those readers and kind of like kind of keep my ear to the ground for notes you know like what do people think um not that i'm going to steer i'm not going to let you know you know the, the the mob steer the book but um but sometimes i will find a uh, a note from somebody that i think is valid be like oh yeah actually yeah this i was asking a question like why did this happen or i don't understand why the book is going in this direction or why did this character do this thing and sometimes when there's a fundamental misunderstanding about something, I have opportunities to address it in the book sometimes, and that scene was a, was one of those kind of moments where I wanted to, you know, just just talk about why why we need that to be there for this for this arc, you know, like what uh, what Clark Kent means to him, what like uh, who Clark Kent is to Superman, like he, that's that's the name he hears clearest, and here's why he wears the glasses and blah blah blah. So yeah, sometimes I'll try to answer people's questions in the book, or if somebody says a, a specific thing that I that really means a lot to me, if they if I if I see um, Superman be be honored in some specific way, I try to write them into. The, I'll, I'll write that person's name into the book, or give them a little nod somewhere. It's just a fun way to keep a dialogue going with all the readers, you know, because I'm a fan too, and being able to write your friends or fellow fans into the book is just a really one of the little perks of the job. That's awesome. When's my cameo? I'm kidding. Oh, dude, yeah. Don't wait. Don't, don't worry. Are there not enough Johns in this arc? <laughs> That's true. Too. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, John. Between uh, between John Kent, John Irons, and John uh, John Corbin, we're all full up right now. But I'll get you in there. You are one hundred percent right about that. That's hilarious. Andrew says it's a nice touch to see each of the characters' voices as distinct as well. Kara talking to Crypto, yes, and Connor talking to Keenan when uh, uh, we're two very distinct voices. Yeah, I'm really glad Connor is. Uh, is is comfortably there. I don't want Connor to be an adversary to the Kent family. Oh, I really, no. I, I yeah. want him. I want him to feel. I mean, again, I mean, conflict is good. It makes for a good story. But there is just like the sentimental thing of it's like, oh, poor Connor's had such a rough ride ever since he's been, you know, introduced. And it's like, oh, he should feel like he belongs. That's that's good. No, we're gonna see. I really want to show. Um, I want to show more of Connor and and Kenan's relationship. Like Connor's been kind of teaching Ken in English through video games and action movies and stuff. And that's really yeah. fun to see. Um, I, I, I really sadly had to cut a little bit of that out of the most recent issue because like this, there was just no space for it. But, um, but both those characters really matter to that whole, to the whole family. And we're going to see more of that for sure. I love, I love the way they kind of, their, their dude bro kind of banter because Ken and I mean, there, there's the, there's the language barrier somewhat because, Kenan doesn't speak English, and many of the of the Kents do speak Mandarin, but Connor does not. So there's a little bit of language barrier between those two guys, but they but they speak the same kind of you know punch on the shoulder, kind of like 
you know, see what you got kind of kind of vibe that they have going on. It's really fun. I, I love seeing those two interact. No, I, I love the dynamic as well. Absolutely. Gavin, although you're very funny, Gavin, and I appreciate it. He's like, I got an issue and a half left of my DC project. I'll sneak you in the background. That's great. Uh, Manipal did that for me in the flash. I was I was in the background of a flash issue and stuff. We'll and get I'm, you in, John. I promise. I'm, stop. It's all good. No, I mean, yeah. Gavin, well, if you wanted that, said to uh, did Nick. Nick, you want to put me in the Hulk? Make me one of the monsters or something like that. That'd be fine. Um, uh, Gavin, I am curious what uh, DC project you're working on. If you can say, if you can't say, I don't want you to spoil. But uh, good for you, man, that you got a a DC assignment. Magic uh, K. It is. Hopefully, I probably shouldn't say. I don't know if it's. I'm not sure if it's announced or not. Yeah, yeah, no, that's Gavin's news. It's cool. Um, Magic K wants to know what your take is on Graham Morrison's unpublished Superman 2000 project. Have you seen it? Are you aware of it? I'm not. Um, is forgive me. Is that okay? Grant and I talked about a thing like that. I don't. Are you talking about the crisis book that ended up not happening? Um, perhaps I don't know. Um, okay. you know, but uh, yeah, Gavin can't reveal, but he will keep us posted. Thank you. Gavin. All right, thanks, Gavin. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> unfortunate. Um, but as far as the Superman thing, um, yeah. you know, um, if it's a, if it's a inside baseball thing, I actually probably shouldn't mention it because it's so dope. And because now, uh, James Gunn's all over Grant's work. I think there's a fair chance we could see it happen in some capacity. If it's the thing I'm thinking of. What do you think of the slate of, uh, gun, uh, projects that uh, have been announced? That looks good. I mean, I, I don't get as mad as people do sometimes. <laughs> like there are a lot of people who have went it their way. And if it's not that way, they get all pissy. And I, I, um, I think all I know is James Gunn makes amazing films and you know, I, it's, yeah. it's hard, it's hard for me to imagine a Superman film in the, in the, <laughs> in the style of Peacemaker, you know, or, or oh, even, yeah. or even Guardians or Suicide Squad, like it just doesn't make sense. Right. So, but I, but I know that James, it's not like James Gunn only makes movies with right. comedy. I'm sure he'll do great. Um, clearly a fan. He's reading all the right books. He actually, um, he plugged Action 1050. He, he posted like my Action 1050 book, which is cool. So I assume he read it. He's plugging, like he said, he's been reading the John Byrne stuff lately. He said he's, you know, he clearly loves All Star. He's mentioned other books he loves. So I mean, he's he's reading all the same shit as me, and he's a great film filmmaker. So I um, I have no reason to doubt him at all. Um, yeah, the stuff I've seen, and I I'm glad he likes Tom's work. It sounds like Supergirl is going to get some heat. I'm I don't know, man. I'm excited. I think it's going to be good. Me too, I mean, man. Self selfishly, I'd love to see War World, War World Saga get get its way in there at some point. I God, think we're going. I think we're doing stuff right now that will lend itself very well. Um, but the things that he's chosen so far are great. So I have, he has all my faith and confidence. No, I'm with you, man. I, I am very with you as far as that goes. And again, I think he's proven himself and clearly is a fan. And I'm thrilled that he's working with King as much as he yeah. is. Yeah. And, uh, I'm, I'm so happy for Jurgens with booster gold. Me too. I, I know that's a great, uh, I mean, that, that it's like, why hasn't there already? I, I know that Booster's shown up in the cartoons and Smallville and Legends of Tomorrow and all that. Oh man! But it's like, I, yeah, I can see, I can see exactly what a Booster Gold James Gunn film would look like. I mean, I don't know if he'll direct. I don't know if he's directing it himself or if he's going to farm it out. But even if he's just on as a producer, I, I think, I think James Gunn could make a kick-ass Booster Gold film. Hundred percent, man. Uh, oh, and yeah, Chatham says, don't forget Swamp Thing. Absolutely. Uh, I'm very excited about that. No, and in fact, um, we've got the authority coming up, which is really interesting. And someone asked earlier why uh, Batman uh, and the authority, that that part of the story hasn't been traded. And I don't know if you had any insight on that. Yeah, that's not a, why it doesn't appear in my in my action yeah. trades. Yes. Um, honestly, if I had to guess, I would say probably price point. Just trying to you know, because it was a supplemental thing. It wasn't like an, it wasn't a crucial part of the story. Um, but um, uh, what should I say? I, I should probably say nothing. But I, there's going to be, I will say with some confidence that there's going to be a collection, like a War World Saga collection. And, and I do have more input on what's going to be in that, that collection. And I insist that issue go in there and not just for the, not just for the sake of that book, but also for stuff that may or may not be coming out in this coming year. 
That sounds great, man. That's excellent. And again, it is those kind of like little moments that I think that make uh, that highlight your runs and everything. Oh, so, uh, B. Graham, twenty three. The last God helped rejuvenate my love for comics when I read it a couple years back as a lapsed reader. Any word when we can expect the next volume? And will Ricardo do the art again? Man, I'm. I don't want to go. I don't want to put put it all on the line and say I would not do another book without Ricardo, or another Last God volume without Ricardo. But I mean, I mean, we co-own it. Like we're the co-owners of the book. So the only way that Ricardo would not be on it is if he doesn't want to be on it. And I know he wants to be on it. Um, I know that. I mean, DC is keeping us jumping right now with stuff. Like Ricardo is a gold mine of an artist. He's just an unbelievable talent. And they're keeping me hopping too. So I, I don't know when we would do it just yet, sadly. Um, so I, I, I want to do it, you know, okay. As of, as a result of this conversation, I'm going to start posting bits of last God on, on social media, just like little bits. There's so much lore in last God. I could post nothing but a last God lore post once a day until I'm 300 years old. I mean, there's just so much lore, not all of which is on the page. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that readers never even seen. So I'd be happy to just, I'll post a little Last God stuff. And if it gets a lot of attention, and if some of that attention goes towards DC Comics, at, you know, writ large, and, you know, that could pressure them to be like, you know, there's a lot of fans out there of this book. We should do it again. Also, if anyone's, if anyone out there is looking for The Last God, it's actually called Book One of the Fellspire Chronicles now. So there might still be some some hardcovers out there with the last God written on them, but there's also the newly printed ones are the Fellspire Chronicles book one. Um, okay. So that's that's going to be the name of the series going forward. I do think there's going to be more at some point. And if they ever, if DC ever tries to get me exclusive, um, that'll be the first stipulation. They're like, I'd love to go exclusive. I need more last. I need to do more Fellspire Chronicles like stat because I love that book more than anything. That's awesome. Um, Lewis wants to know more detail of what it's like working with Ricardo. I mean, insane. I mean, he's 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 so good. He's um, honestly, we don't even need to communicate that much now because we just we know what each. I know what he's going to do, and I feel like he understands what I'm going to give him to do. Like it's, we have this really great wordless relationship. Um, he was just, he just puts so much of him. So he puts so much design into the pages that I don't even ask for. So I, I, I've kind of gotten used to, I know how much to ask for. Like, I know what to say and what to leave out and let him fill in the gaps, you know, man, he's just so talented. Um, <laughs> I will say, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to color Ricardo because he already puts so much, so much vibrancy and, and texture and, and like, space and mass everything with his pencils he did for anyone who doesn't know he doesn't even ink his work all of his line work is so clean it just goes right to right to print from pencils wow. um and he, he does a lot of texture and shading and stuff with his own pencils so i imagine i mean i'm not a colorist obviously but i imagine it's tricky the color somebody you already put so much on the page like how do you how do you color it and add your own stuff your own uh, rendering without mudding up what what ricardo's already done so anyway interesting no that's that's, that's amazing uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a genius in fact uh, sorry it's like one more last point on that or uh, ricardo and i did together a a short story in the gotham city villains thing last year and they had us do a racial ghoul batman story and um that was kind of my love letter to chess actually because i always envision in in my head canon batman and and Raish have a it's Roz actually and uh, and I got Raish from the cartoon but it should be Roz. I always say Raz Al Ghul and it actually I think it was the Nolan movies that made it Raish Al Ghul and I'm like God and in fact even in the Batman cartoon when David Warner played Al Ghul it was Roz and I'm like I'm sorry man I I had twenty I, plus years of calling him Roz and I'm like I yeah, I, it's, I, it, I it's, can't call him Raish Al Ghul. I mean, it's from Arabic, right? So it should be it should be Raz Al Ghul. So anyway, I don't know because because even Denny O'Neill, uh, right. when I when I spoke to him near the near the end of his life and stuff, he was calling him Raish, and I'm like, Denny. Right. I, I think I think it was probably as a result of the cartoon, but I could be wrong. Um, I don't know. I don't anyway, know. it doesn't matter. But it's uh, Aaron, Aaron wanted to know if uh, Ricardo will do a variant of uh, a cover for uh, Hulk. I think he's DC exclusive. Oh, okay. 
But no, I, one thing I wanted to say though about that chess story, he um in my head canon, Batman and Roz have a um have a chess game that continue like whenever they they meet, they make a like somebody makes a chess move. And like uh, my dad and I used to play chess that way. My dad would uh and he would send me a letter and at the at the bottom of the of the letter there would be like a little chess code, you know, symbol for a chess move. Sure. And um, I would have a little board and my little travel set in my room and I would make the move. And then when I wrote back, I would give him a move and we'd play that way. Um, <clears throat> and I envisioned Batman and, and Roz playing that way. And I actually, I chose a specific chess game by these two grandmasters from the 19th century that I really love. And, um, and I, <laughs> I had to tell Ricardo because I knew Ricardo would do it. And I know he, I know how he, he sinks his teeth into these kind of details and like puts all this love into the page more than is necessary. So I, I knew he would dig it and would not get annoyed. And so I was like, here's the chess game. Like, here's the, here is the, the play. Here's the, um, we're on move six white here. Like this is, this is what the, the board should look like. Here's what it should look like by this page. Here's what it should look like at the end. Um, you know, it's important that Batman is the player because this other person is more, you know, aggressive, blah, blah, blah. And he got, he was all into it and he nailed the whole thing. And it was just so fun, man. I just, I love putting that kind of, I want that stuff to hold up. And Ricardo does too. Somebody, so that's, the, somebody that's the full answer. What it's like to work with Ricardo. It's like that. Okay. It's like, we're, we're both just putting more and more and more love and detail into the page. Regarding the Agul family, someone had asked if, as I guess you use them in future state, that Superman and, and the Agul family were maybe at odds. And they were wondering if uh, we might see, the Agul family show up in uh, present day Superman uh, stories that you're writing. Um, I shouldn't say actually. Fair I don't enough. Think, I don't, I don't want to spoil anything. Again, Philip, that's the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, man. It's like I think I think uh, my fans are starting to see me as an easy mark. Like, yeah, well, I, I, you know, it, it, it reminds me of the mystery of Hush when Loeb and uh, and Jim Lee were making it and stuff. Could Hush be the Riddler? Let me get back to you. You know, it's like, you know, yeah, no, no, no. You know, it's like whatever. And I, and uh, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Like Robert says, keep them guessing. Uh, all of, uh, absolutely true, man. And Lewis, uh, you're, uh, or I actually somebody earlier, was it, uh, was, it was either, oh yeah, here it is. RP chat up. John is so happy talking here with Philip. It's so <laughs> precious. Philip and I have become fast friends. Exactly. Both it was both ways. A couple years, but we really, we, we, we're, we're, you know, I don't know. We, 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 are on the right wavelength with each other. And, and I know we the same way. And it's great. I, Dude, you know, when you come to town, you're like, hey, I'm in town. Let's grab a meal. Fuck yeah. I literally, it's like, all right, if I don't already have plans, and if I do, it's like, what can I do to make it happen so we can see each other? It's always great. Exactly. We, we we hung out either right before or right after Christmas. Right before Christmas. Yeah, right before, yeah, because the, yeah. the band was playing in the Chicago Symphony Hall, and you were around, yes. and you took me to the guest diner. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's right. Oh, my God. No, that's one of my favorite joints, one of my favorite press breakfast joints. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, 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 Koshik Raja wants to know, will we ever get the Superman Hulk crossover with them in their gladiatorial outfits? Man, that would be great. <laughs> War World Superman versus Planet Hulk Hulk. Please. Oh, Honestly, I I mean, the gladiatorial stuff aside, I do have an idea I'd love to do for Superman Hulk crossover if you want it. Hit up DC and Marvel. Let's make it happen. I feel like it's different than it was back in the '90s. Now, like this all, you know, those those companies are, you know, yeah, it's a shame. It's under bosses to the big bosses of of the corporations that kind of oh, steer yeah. thing. Like they hate each other a lot more than they used to. So at least that their their dads' dads' dads hate each other. So I I can't imagine it working, but it would be awesome. I so agree. Was it was it Dave Gibbons and Steve Rude who did? Uh... The Hulk Superman stuff, and then I know Steve. Honestly, I don't remember. I don't I remember seeing Steve it, but I don't remember. And I and I think I'm I, Dave might have written it. Yeah, I just talked to Dave. I don't remember. Yeah, um, I, I'll always associate the Amalgam comic stuff with, with my friend Ron, but Ron I, don't Hart, know, yeah. I don't know. Who, I don't know who did. I know. I remember the uh, the Spider Spider Boy thing. And sure. The, the dark. Bruce, Wayne, Bruce Wayne, Agent of Shield. Yeah. Um, God, yeah. So many, so many fun things, but I, I can't remember who wrote specific books. But yeah, this was, um, I think this was earlier than DC versus Marvel. And um, yeah, it was literally like uh, Steve Rude was channeling uh, the Fleischer cartoons for, for the way he drew Superman. Oh, and cool. certainly his Hulk was definitely a, like first year Jack Kirby Hulk. <laughs> and, it, and it really was this a beautiful, I mean, I've 
I bought it on eBay in the last couple of years. I bought an old copy of it and stuff because it is such a great story. So, yeah, even better than the um, the old dollar comics when they had Batman and the Hulk together in one yeah, of the. I read a lot of that old stuff and I don't own them and I haven't read them in years. So I got to find them again. That's funny. Oh, here. <laughs> What's this? Andrew says there's also a Pete, uh, Pete Ross, a weird spinoff clone of Connor and Ben. Huh. All right. I didn't know that. Um, oh, this is great, Taylor. Great question. Since Hulk is going to be such a heavy metal book, will each issue have a soundtrack? That's such a great idea. You know, that's a great idea. Yeah. Jesus, man. I love, you know, I was, I always tell Dave Gibbons that about um, the originals. And, you know, it's the, it's the mods. It's a future version of the British mods and, and the mod movement of the late 50s and early 60s. And for years I was begging him. I'm like, Dude, you gotta come up with a playlist. And finally, he's like, you know, there is one. I, I made one on Spotify. I'm like, oh, that's great, Dave. Because truly, I want to, and especially that period, late '50s, early '60s, and stuff. And it was more jazz, and it was, I mean, it was pre-Beatles, so it really isn't the obvious British invasion stuff we might think of of British music in the '60s. It's that period before, and and yeah, and you know, and you know, Dave on his scooter and stuff, motorcycle and stuff. It cracks me up. I love it. Um, but oh, yeah, I should, I should put together a playlist. I'll I'll try to do that and uh, and get post that stuff on social so you can you can hear what I'm hearing while I'm reading those books. Thank you, Gary. Gary answers my question. It was Roger Stern and Steve Rude. I saw um, that. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely, great, great thing. But yeah, I and I agree, Ro, uh, Roberts or robot uh, Ro, Roboters one hundred. Pardon me. I feel like uh, music and comics should be intermingling more. I totally agree. You know, there's a um, the band that I play with actually, the Army Field Band. Um, they during COVID, we were we were creating a lot of video content because it was unsafe to go to and play to bring people together for our live concerts like we usually do. So we mostly got off the road and did a lot of video stuff. And they actually produced a um, or they let me produce a, a short video, say like 15 minutes, maybe 15 20, um, with the music from the comics I've written. Because I've written a lot of comics that either appeared on the back cover as sheet music or um, like poems or songs appear in the, in the interior of the comic. But there's there's music with those. There's back matter in all my Last God issues, Felspar Chronicles issues. Yep. Um, so, yeah, if you if you let's see, if you go to YouTube and look up my full name, see Philip Kennedy Johnson, Army Field Band. Music and storytelling or something like that. Um, it should it should come up. You might not even need to put all that in there, but um, but yeah, there is a video there where you can see and hear some of the music that I that we recorded as trailers for the Last God before it came out, or just my friends and I playing music that um, that I wrote for Warlords of Appalachia or Last God, or um, you know even just a, we did a, like a jazz trio arrangement that I did of Can You Read My Mind from Superman the movie, the John Williams like the the flying theme. Yeah, I did. I did like a jazz waltz <laughs> version of it. So yeah, we put a little video of that on YouTube. That's fantastic, God! I was just talking to somebody about, uh, unfortunately, the the bad disco songs that nobody remembers, but it really is what killed disco. And I remember <laughs> there was a disco version of "Can You Read My Mind," and I'm just like, Oh my God! Arf. No, no, wrong, so wrong. Uh, Arboro Snake wants to know uh, what metal bands have you been listening to lately, and are you a fan of? Am I saying it right, Opeth? I don't know Opeth. Um, the stuff that I listen to is mostly stuff from my youth, but there's a there's a Scandinavian band that's like Viking stuff lately that I really like. Um, shoot, what is that band called? Forgive me. Uh, yeah, I don't. I shouldn't pull right. it up on YouTube. But usually, no. I'll, I'll put it up on YouTube and I'll listen to it while I'm working out or something. It's like just super hard, like thrashing viking stuff but it, it sounds like you hear the viking influence in it but it's metal when uh, uh, when you come to, when you come to chicago next there's a great burger joint called kuma's corner and okay. it is they and they they make really great crazy burgers they name them after metal bands it's totally a metal restaurant and bar and they have micro brews and and other things but uh it's when i go there again everybody as we all know i'm 58 and it's like the funniest thing to hear some serious hardcore metal. And I'm just like, yeah, how you doing? Here's grandpa. Grandpa needs a table where, you know, and I went with my, one of my college buddies and the two of us are like, in our, uh, you know, we're all to cockers. We're like old men. And it's just like, 
All right. And we're like bobbing our heads to the music. All right, whatever. <laughs> Not my taste, but I have no problem with it. And it just kills me that it's just this wall to wall, very serious metal. Not not the obvious stuff. It's very, very cool. And uh, you love it. So we got to go there. Yeah, I'd love to go. That's awesome. Anthony Coletta. Or Colella. <laughs> yeah. David Steinmeier with the Air Force Band has the best recording of Can You Me to Read My Mind. Nice. Is that true? I, I don't, don't know. know. Uh, oh, God. Yes. Oh, I didn't know this. If you want bad disco, there's a disco version of the theme from the Hulk 70 show. Oh, the wandering man, the piano thing, the lonely man, whatever it's called. I guess so. That's horrible. That's what they were. I mean, because everyone's like, disco was great. Nile Rodgers and Chic and New Order and all these guys, like the, the song from Wonder Woman uh, 84. And it's like, yeah, that's the good stuff. Meanwhile, we had like the I Love Lucy song set to disco music. And other bad things like that. I'm like, it was just, it, it became a parody of itself. That's why it went away. So, oof. Ugh, you're killing me, people, with these observations. Horrible. James Bond, uh, how are things going in the story? Where are you at? This is the second arc, right? Yeah, second arc. Yeah, I'm about to turn in. Well, I turned in um, <laughs> the first half of issue number two the other day, actually. Um, it's, dude, it's so good. It's been really fun. Um Giorgio Spoletta is, is the artist for this one. Say again, and excuse me, I was speaking over you. Giorgio Spoletta is the artist. He's an Italian artist, super great. Um, he is, um, he's doing, yeah, he's doing some of the best work of his career. He's doing, he was doing some stuff at Boom most recently, but just really took the challenge on this book. He's all, I mean, every panel is, or is choreographed like an action film, just Clearly loves Bond. Clearly loves to, to draw action scenes. Just crushing it. I love it. The um, the big challenge of this arc was to make it a good jumping on point without having to read the previous story because it was it really does continue from the previous arc. Like the, the last one ended with number six, and there was this huge crazy reveal at the end of issue six for somebody we thought was dead was not dead, and that changes everything and that kind of springboarded this into the second arc, and that just started. Um, and then. Dynamite's like we're gonna start. With, we're gonna give it a new, a new number one in the subtitle. So instead of just 007, now it's 007 for King and Country. Um, kind of a play on a quote from the first arc. And I was like, well, if it's number one though, then they won't have necessarily read the first arc. They're like, figure it out. I'm like, all right, let's do it. It's because it's a celebration of of Bond's the big anniversary year for Bond and everything. Um, so we are we're doing. I don't want to spoil too much, but basically. Well, it's okay. I think they put it in, in the solicit. So I'll just say this this new arc for King and Country has basically got Bond and his companion going up against all the other double O's. Like they're kind of on the run in the in the um aftermath of the first arc. They're on the run. They have their mission that they have to do. Meanwhile, MI6 is MI6 has sent all the other double O's after him. So we get to see finally meet a lot of the other double O agents and um how they all interact, which is really fun. That's beautiful, man. I love it. And yeah, George is a great artist for it. I was going to say, man, no, Dynamite always picks great artists for the Bond stuff. And I'm so glad that people like yourself and Andy Diggle and Jeff Parker have had the opportunities to write Bond. And yeah, man, no, I think you're given your background. Who's who better to write James Bond? I think. Oh, thanks, man. Absolutely, man. No, you know, it's uh, again, I, I love Bond. You know, I still again, it's it's been uh, it's been a long time. I still haven't brung myself to watch No Time to Die. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to see him die, man. Sometimes you just have to, you just have to respect the rules, even if no, even if there are no rules. If they, if you feel like you're not supposed to watch it, just don't watch it, man. It's okay. I, I maybe eventually, I have no idea, but I really, and I'm very interested and intrigued in what might come next. And we've gotten a little bit here and there of what might come next for Bond. Um, it's a, it's a challenge, I think. You know, do you, oh, totally. do you feel, um, you're writing a timeless Bond? Or are you writing a bond for today's world? I hope it. I hope it's a timeless bond. Yeah, I don't want it to be. I mean, there are little things that. I mean, there's always it's always going to be dated to some degree by the the look of the cars and the technology and everything. But um, hopefully not. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm tr I try not to date it with. I mean, the things that date it in a bad way, like in the past, or the the or, or Bond's own character, like the way that, like in the novels, how sometimes he is depicted as kind of. Um, it's kind of disrespectful of women or of certain minorities or that kind of thing. Like, just sometimes he just says things that these days go down a little rougher than they did back in the day. Certainly, 
And that's um, been in the news lately. You're right. You're yeah, right. and there's there's none of that, obviously. But well, um, of course not. No, no. I, ideally, I want it to be a timeless bond that feels like the movies. Because sometimes you get a sometimes you get a take in the comics that's a little more like fun and cartoony in a way, like a little more. I don't know. It's not something you would think of seeing in the film. And to me, they feel they feel more like films than books, even now. Like they just like the I feel like there's a, the movies cast a very long shadow. So the, the trick was to make it feel like a Bond film visually, but also make it read more like a John le Carré spy novel. Because I wanted it to be, I knew that I want, if I was going to do this gig at all, because again, I'm underwater as hell. I can say if I'm going to do this gig, I want it to be worth it. I want it to be something that, that really stands up over time. And, and you never see Bond as a spy. You know, you see him always blowing shit up, making lots of noise, um, doing stuff very unbecoming a spy, you know, not. Yeah, yeah. Not- it's an oxymoron if he's yeah. called a secret agent. He's the most public-faced secret totally. agent. I'm yeah, very, How very, are you? Welcome back. Yes. Very unespionage behavior. So I uh, I wanted to do a version that is much more and not like a spy book. Sure. But also make it feel like a film because I think that's how most people know Bond. You're right. No, absolutely, man. I mean, not just the more recent work, but the fact that it has been 60 years. And you know, yeah, the the books have a decade on on the movies, but I, I do think you're right. Absolutely, my God, these movies are international, iconic films. And I, the original six, six, five Connery, and yeah, and even the Lazenby one, um, to me, those are like the jet set era of travel of fifties and sixties uh, lifestyle that is captured in those original movies. And I love that. I love that they're international cast. Gert Frober being Goldfinger, and all the all the uh, women that were used as Bond women in in the Connery films, in particular. Yeah, I just uh, it really evokes that period. And uh, you know, it was event television when they'd be shown on ABC on Sunday nights. Everything stopped. I mean, that's all we talked about on Monday was watching Bond for three hours. So, <laughs> all right. You know, so let me just ask a question whether every Bond comic needs its own Bond girl theme. Yes, I was going to post that up here. Here we go. So, yeah, every Bond girl is that what do you how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, kind of not. I mean, the um, I mean, you can't borrow you can't just borrow a song from one of the other movies, right? So, there actually is going to I have thought about that, and I, as everyone knows, I like to write music and poetry and stuff in my comics, and um, yeah. Gwendolyn Gann, the Bond girl of these of these series. Um, she's a poet. She actually writes poetry when she's just kind of screwing around. She has a much more artistic kind of personality than Bond, who's just a blunt instrument, as he describes himself. So um, he's going to... So we're going to see some poetry in this book that is that kind of represents the Bond girl. So there's not actually going to be music playing or anything because it's a comic, but, but there is going to be a song of sorts that you'll see by the end of the series. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Again, I'm looking at the chat... And you'll forgive me, folks. I'm not trying to be rude when I ask you to rewind when you've got a question that Philip has already covered. But I, I do want to talk about new things. I think the thing I, I do think Bond women, and obviously, we want women to have more agency, and everyone is for that. But I also do think that Bond women should be. I mean, there should be beautiful Bond women. I'm sorry, that's part of the story to me. And if you make beautiful women that are also capable. Uh, and also, I really think if you do granularly go back to a lot of the women in the Bond films, yeah, there are damsels in distress. Yes, there are whatever. But really, I think there are a lot of examples from every Bond film decade where, I mean, hey, uh, unfortunate name, Pussy Galore, but a very very capable woman in Goldfinger. And I would say the same thing about uh, the For Your Eyes Only character. Uh, in the in the film and stuff that really is out for revenge and a much more complex. And then yeah, you get Tiffany Christmas, you know, uh, Denise Richards in the world is not enough. And it's like, yeah, sure, she's a nuclear scientist. Okay, okay, but yeah, man, I you know, uh, yeah, I know Gwendolyn Gann is not the first capable Bond girl we've had, but it was important to me to see her as an actual double O, someone who actually is like a mentor to him, not just not just a, a conquest, but somebody who actually kind of taught him the ropes. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm really stoked to to see where she where her character goes in this next arc and how people see. I, I like the character a lot. So hopefully readers do too. Absolutely, man. Uh, Aaron wants to know: Would cosmic horror be a possibility in the future of your Hulk run? Oblivion, Galactus, 
Mystery's Death and Thanos, Galaxy Master, the Spikes. So maybe after this uh, initial arc, do you see that as a... At some point, possibly, yeah. I Not just yet, though, because the... Uh, the I think the announcement already mentioned there's this thing that we're that we are creating called the mother of horrors um and the mother of horrors is tied up in the in the um in the stories like the demiurge and demigorge and all that stuff that um, kind of like the the ancient past uh, mythology of marvel universe um that is wrapped up in the origins of earth specifically so according to that mythology all the all the demons and devils and monsters of all kinds in a way are kind of kind of, Oh, their, their lineage comes from the Demiurge. And um, so the, that all kind of comes into play in the, the events of this book, like all the, the monsters that we're going to see are like the lost children of, of uh, the monsters of earth, you know, like a specifically earthbound stuff. So you're not going to see things like Fin Fang Foom or, um like galactus necessarily those kind of things those don't really have a place in this particular story whereas the that is one thing that sets it apart from the ewing run where the ewing run is all about like black science and eventually did make space for things like the one above all and galactus and those kinds of things um this one is more i mean it all exists in the same world and it all makes sense together but this one is more like you know, earthbound monstrosities and profanities that uh, that come from here. Gary says, congrats on the Hulk book, Philip. Uh, oh, that's thanks. Cool. Absolutely. Oh, Glenn um, Clark. Dude, Glenn is a super fan. His his uh, his icon there is a book I wrote for him, actually, or uh, I signed to him. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's he's, a big, he's a big Superman guy. Clearly. Yes, I see that. Absolutely, man. That's fantastic. Um Dude, what else? I mean, I, I you know, I, you know, sometimes we'll do a marathon of two hours. Where at? Uh, I know. We should probably wrap it up soon. Let me see. Anything, yeah. any final thoughts I want to leave you with? Yeah, please, man. Um, God, I don't know, man. I'm just so grateful to be doing these books. I can't. I mean, I, you know, I try to keep time for myself to do other things and all that. I try to make sure that I have time to do the best work. But when I get when I get a shot like Hulk, man, Hulk is just an opportunity to tell stories that deeply matter. I know, like, comics are about you know, visual spectacle and, you know, just big fun fights that are fun to look at and all that. But they also, there's, there's such an, there's such fertile ground for telling stories that deeply matter, you know, and I think they could be such easy shorthand for, uh, for meaningful stuff. And I have a story that, that uh, I care about very much that I want to tell with Hulk. And I think that Hulk is just a, it's like a, it's my love letter to the American South. It's, it's my love letter to American mythology. It's my thoughts on, um, you know, how to be a better person, like how to deal with your own demons. And there's a, there's a lot to say on Hulk. And uh, I mean, plus the Superman series I'm doing in action comics and the Hulk series we're about to do in Incredible Hulk kind of sum up the difference, like the big, most fundamental difference between DC and Marvel to me. Like DC feels like mythology. Like when you're, when you're writing, DC stuff. If, when you're writing a Superman book, it's like you're contributing to the to the prose edda. <laughs> you know, you're contributing to the Old Testament of of culture. You know, like just this this God who walks among us as a man. And same thing with with Batman and Wonder Woman and Green Lantern and like they're the they're the pantheon. You know, and it's uh, when you're writing stories in Marvel, it's like you're writing stories about ourselves and each other and about you know it's different it just feels very different it's, you're telling stories about individual people and their quirks and problems and demons blown up larger for the comic whereas dc like you're writing a modern day mythology that will outlive us the way that people once told stories about odin and thor and loki so no i yeah. agree kevin agrees as well and yeah no you're absolutely right about that man Wesley says, I haven't picked up a Marvel book since War of Realms ended, but you've got my picking up action comics again. I think I'll have to give this Hulk run a shot. Absolutely. Thanks, when, does, when, when, does, uh, when does the run start, buddy? June 21st. And my friend David Pepos puts out um, the Hulk annual the month before that, and there's a five-page short in there that does tee up uh, the first issue. Oh, that's great to hear, man. I'm going to see yeah. David at um, 
C two E two, and I think I'm doing a panel that he's going to be on. Awesome, good. So, Dave and I are Dave and I are good friends. <laughs> he was nobody hustles like that dude. I'll say that like I, he's, he's such a hard worker, and he just he chases down work and he crushes it. And he's man, he's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I think the world of David. I like his creator own stuff, and agree and I agree with you. I think he works very hard, and I'm glad to see that he's getting the opportunities that he has at Marvel. Savage Avengers was a great run. And uh, yeah, that's great. Oh, that's funny. Gavin says he worked with uh, David a few years ago. Oh, cool. So yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. He did. Yeah, he was. He and I tabled next to each other at Heroes once, Heroes Con. And um, <laughs> I swear, there was not a single dude who went down that aisle that David did not speak to personally, <laughs> like twenty feet away, whatever. Like he was just all over it. No, Dave's one of my favorite guests. Where I go, hey, Dave, how you doing? And then it's sixty minutes later, and David's still talking. <laughs> yeah, totally. that's great. No, no, that's hey, that's I, I uh, ladies and gentlemen, David Pepos. I get out of the way and I let him talk. I think that's fantastic. He's great. He's so, he knows how lucky he is to be working in comics, and he's he's always excited about it. Uh, Peter Beiser, excited to pick up your run. Uh, he also got uh, Jim Rugg's uh, uh, Grand Design uh, Hulk book and everything, so that's cool. Awesome, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, the the Jim Rugg book was great, especially as I was kind of reminding myself of all the like when i was thinking about whether to take the gig or not i actually i read jim rugg's uh grand design and it's kind of like this primer on the entire hulk history and it was exciting man it got me into hulk it got me into jim rugg's work too i mean just his his um the way he boiled down entire years of work into like a single page in some cases so artfully and thoughtfully done jim's just a yeah just a a true artist. Uh, no, I agree with you, and I love talking to him, and I love the way his his brain works. And uh, I've I've you know Aphrodisiac and Octobriana and all of his other creator owned stuff that he's done, and I love cartoonist kayfabe that he, the the show that he does with yeah. that poster. Exactly, a tremendous show. It shows uh, how much those two guys know. Like they just know a lot about a lot. It's it's cool. A hundred percent, man. No, they're 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 excellent. Oh, Magic K hopes I'll interview Dan Mora at uh, C two E two. Well, you know, I, what I should do is talk to DC and see if I could talk to Dan before C2E2 because I don't really do floor interviews anymore. Mm. I'm, I'm as 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 Philip will attest, I'm running for mayor when I'm uh, at a convention. <laughs> I'm, I'm networking, I'm shaking hands, I'm kissing babies, talking to fans, talking, but mostly talking to creators and really lining them up for new new conversations and stuff. That's that's and touching base with people. How you doing? Let's have coffee. Let's have a meal or whatever. So yeah, I, uh, but no, God, um, Wade has been gushing about working with Dan Mora and apparently how fast he is. And now he's going to have two books, two monthly books. That's how fast he, I know. Insane. You know, I mean, this yeah. is like Kirby level speed and that's, that's pretty amazing. And Peter says he's a really nice guy too. That's good to hear. So yeah, everybody, uh, C2E2, I got several panels as we get closer. I'll, I'll talk more about them. Uh, but uh, well, one I'll mention right away is, of course, my good friend Sven Gulli, the one, the the best horror host in the business. <laughs> right. Looking forward to talking to him again, and of course we'll do the uh, yeah panel on Sunday with uh, Arden Franco and the guys. But uh, Philip, way to go! I mean, as yeah. always, I'm so excited for this opportunity and the ability to tell these Hulk stories because I know how much it means to you. Thanks, brother. It's always great to see you. I'm always impressed by how much you know and love talking to you. I always walk away smarter and happier. So, oh, that's kind of, well. That's very kind, man. Because let's be honest, well, you know, this is, you know, <laughs> picking your nose. Like, yeah, I, I really like that episode of Mork and Mindy when Raquel Welch was there. No, nah, man, it's all culture, and you know so much about it. And um, it's always a pleasure talking to you. That's awesome, man. Too funny. Um, Thanks to all the fans who got in here too. There's a ton of people in this chat. I really appreciate all the comments and questions, and the readers, of course. Thanks for showing up. Your enthusiasm and knowledge always blows me away, everybody. Thank you very much for being a big part of these chats. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Tomorrow night, gee, I wonder if I got any Star Trek to talk about. The card <laughs> is killing it. And um, the, the demise of Discovery, I won't deny I've been dancing on that grave. I'm sorry for the disco fans that love it. I don't. But uh, And even Chris Pine said something interesting about the Trek movies. So I'll be talking that. with, uh, yeah, with Mitch and Franco, and I'm not going to bore Philip with it. Philip always, whether he likes it or not, when we're at, we're together, I probably talk too much Star Trek with it's him. It's okay. It doesn't like offend me or anything. I just don't know anything. I know. Well, that's why. <laughs> why am I going to bore you with that? So no. it's like, that's like metal, man. I'll, I'll I'll take, you know, my grains of salt of metal with you in discussion. But yeah, it's like, 
no, I don't want to talk about metal for three hours with you. Of course not. But that's <laughs> that's just me. But uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. More great word balloon uh, tomorrow night. And next week's going to be a big week, too. Tom we, uh, Tom King is coming back. I'm going to have Mr. Skin back uh, because uh, he's doing his annual uh, movie awards to, to coincide with the Oscars. So those are just a couple of the highlights of things that are coming up still to come in March. Until next time, stay safe, stay happy, and stay healthy. So